Okay, um, back again here real quick to wrap up, and I need to head to bed. Uh, but again, I can at least uh, sleep a little later than usual. Um, so again, uh, here's this video is going to be number two, and I do want you to take some notes on this um, little mini lesson here as we go through things, and you can pause and rewatch them or whatever you want to do. Um, also, this uh, this is a picture of a sweet fish I caught last week uh, on Thursday during uh, the official spring break time. Went up and did some fishing in the uh, Conneaut River in northeast, extreme northeast Ohio. Um, it's caught this pretty nice, that's a, called a steelhead trout. Anyways, a lot of fun. Um, so again, when you do take these notes, I want you to submit a picture of them just by clicking this link, or you can click the link over here underneath uh, reminders and announcements, and then also things for you to do uh, sometime before Friday at 8 p.m. Our it's biochemistry um, lab, and then an article to read and answer some questions about about the uh, evolution of this virus that's going around right now. Um, so let's go uh, here. Let's we're going to talk about some kind of wrap up some things here with uh, our evolution unit. Let's try a laser pointer again. Um, so again, this is just kind of to wrap up some things. And again, I'm trying to be a little quiet here because everyone else is sleeping. But um, because it's kind of a mixture of some some different ideas, but more of uh, more than not, it's just talking about patterns that exist in um, how things have evolved over time on Earth, and um, you know things that you can just take a look at that are alive right now and see some of these things going on but um these are first of all these are a couple of things that you've actually seen before when we did the uh the we built that fossil poster with the little crustaceous animals um so there's these two patterns you can see in the fossil record one is called gradualism which is more common and the other is punctuate equilibrium and it's all about the rates of change Gradualism is you see this just slow, steady, incremental changes throughout time and punctuate equilibrium is where you see a really rapid change in a short period of time and then things kind of just stay the same and then they may go through a rapid change again at a later time. Here's a couple pictures of those. This would be um, gradualism on the left and punctuated, punctuated equilibrium on the right and where you see uh, just slow incremental changes and here you get rapid change and then things just stay the same. And you can kind of see this, this is an actual um, evolutionary tree or phylogenetic tree of some dinosaurs. On the left side, you see some things that uh, evolved very quickly and then kind of stayed the same over time. So this would be punctuate equilibrium on the left and then this group is more of you know just steady gradual changes uh, over a longer period of time so this is more gradualism on the right typically see this more um, with most species in the fossil record you see gradualism more so than punctuated equilibrium um all right and then this idea is really huge uh, kind of ideas is what we call convergent or divergent evolution uh, divergent, just like any time you're talking about diverging, it means things are, you know, spreading apart and going away from each other. And um, so what the idea here is that, you know, you, if you look at any branch on this tree, you, you see like, you know, the trunk is the common ancestor and then things just spread out and diverge from that common ancestor. This would be um, like an extreme example of divergent evolution that we call adaptive radiation, where there is an, a common ancestor to a bunch of species that are pretty closely related 
and you see this on uh, with Darwin's finches on the Galapagos Islands. There's, um, I think, nine to eleven species, maybe fifteen that um, exist there uh, throughout those islands, and they all had a single common ancestor. And so the, the idea is that it, uh, you know, radiated out from this common ancestor. So it's called adaptive radiation. They've all adapted to specific uh, diets is what it is. So like here you got uh, fruit eater, uh, insect eaters, cactus eaters, seed eaters, and then also this, you know, kind of um, organized by where they're getting this food at. So these are tree finches here, the warbler, um, and then ground finches over here uh, on the right. So again, this is called adaptive radiation, just like a you know, very drastic divergent evolution. Um, this idea that you guys learned about earlier this week, um, so one result of divergent evolution is that you see homologous structures, or you could look at it as when you see homologous structures, that means that um, there's been divergent evolution happening, that these species have a common ancestor from which they diverged. Uh, and so we look at things like homologous structures. In this example, we have uh, representatives from different um, groups of vertebrates, which would be amphibians, reptiles, birds, and then these mammals here. Uh, fish are not represented here, which is interesting because you know fish are the oldest of the vertebrates, and uh, so the. You know, the bone structures are not as you know quite as um, similar as these groups, but but what you can see is the same bones: the humerus, the radius, the ulna, the carpals, uh, metacarpals, phalanges. You see the same bones in all these groups. They're just they've um, they've been modified over time to specific uh, adaptations that. I don't know if you knew things like, you know, inside of a whale flipper are the same bones that you'd find in a bat or a human or a frog. It's the humerus, the radius, the ulna. And the point here is that homologous structures indicate there's a common ancestor from which things have diverged. So you see a pattern of divergent evolution. And the opposite of this is what we call convergent evolution where you have uh, different species that are becoming more alike over time. And so when you see this happening, it shows that there is not a close common ancestor. For example, let's just look at an example. There's uh, like if you compare a bat and a butterfly, <coughs> like how I did that cough there into the elbow. Um, Bats and butterflies, they, so they look alike. Obviously, they have wings, they fly. Not close to related. These, uh, you know, they've converged to be alike from, you know, two different ancestors. So they've become more alike. And just, I guess, in the fact that they fly and they have wings. So if you go way back to, like, Aristotle, when he talked about classification, he he would group these together because they are both flying animals, but they're really not close to related. So again, convergent evolution is just when things have evolved to, you know, have a similar shape and function, but they are not coming from a common ancestor. They've coming from different ancestors just happen to look alike. Here's examples of that. These are four different um, species that all have an elongated nose that eat insects. But again, these are not closely related. They've evolved in different places just to be doing the same thing. Um, so they don't have a close common ancestor. This would be an example of convergent evolution. Um, Again, the reason we would call this analogous structures, which you learned about in that activity earlier this week. Again, analogous structures like wings. They serve the same purpose, similar shape, but they're not 
you know, doesn't show that they're closely related. They just happen to both be flying and have wings. So again, analogous structures, like, you know, what you see when you have convergent evolution shows that there's not necessarily a common ancestor. They're not close related again, like a, a bat and a insect flying insect like a um, ladybug not close to related they just supposed to have to have wings and uh, be able to fly a bird and a bat a little closer related than a bat and a ladybug but again not real closely related and similar function called analogous structures shows that convergent evolution is happening and then uh, something kind of cool to look at is a kind of an extreme example of convergent evolution that we call mimicry when you get, um, you know, things that look like other things just because it's been an advantage for them to have those traits. They're not, you know, close to related. For example, this snake um, blends in really well with leaf debris. Okay, obviously, the snake's not related to leaves. Um, or a tree, they just look similar because this was an advantage for the snake to blend in. Um, really cool things like this. This is a an insect. It's not a it's not a leaf. But again, they're they're not related to leaves. They're just uh, just mimicking that the the ones that looked more like leaves over time survived better until you get this really drastic uh, example of that. Here's more, uh, there's a couple of butterflies. One's called a, these are two different species, really uh, kind of famous example of mimicry. One is a um, monarch butterfly and the other one's called a viceroy. Uh, two different species of butterflies. They look almost identical. And the, in the um, explanation is that the monarch is toxic. It's got a um, substance inside of it called a cardiac glycoside, which is um, it's toxic. It makes the predator sick that eat it, and they learn not to eat or mess with uh, things that look like that. And so this other species is just over time evolved to look very much like the monarch because predators leave it alone. If you look like anything that resembled the monarch and the viceroy is not toxic at all. On uh, this picture here, you've got, uh, well, maybe you could guess which one, one of them is a fly and one of them is a, a uh, hornet. Um, the one on the left is the fly and the one on the right is the hornet. These are around here too. You've probably been around them. This types of fly that look like this and you just maybe didn't even know it. Uh, you just assumed it was a, a, um, a stinging creature, a hornet or a bee of some kind. But again, advantage to a fly that has any kind of resemblance to a, a hornet and that predators will leave it alone. And I think this might be the last one I have, but this is again, a real famous uh, example. One of these snakes is poisonous, uh, it's venomous. The other one is not, it's completely harmless. Some of you might know which one is which. Uh, there's a saying you might have learned. It goes uh, um, red on black, friend of Jack, and red on yellow, kill a fellow. And so the idea there is, um, you know, this is the, um, I think it's a milk snake or a type of king snake, but it's it's harmless. It's non-venomous and the red and black colors are in contact with each other. That's where you get the friend of Jack. And then over here, the red and yellow, this is a coral snake, pretty venomous. And those are in contact with each other. So again, the red and yellow will kill a fellow. So, you know, if you ever happen to be around these, I would just generally stay away from it. Like most other predators do, they don't mess with the uh, milk snake here because it, it looks like the venomous coral snake. It's just the advice I give to you. Just don't, you know, don't get too close or mess with them. All right, so that's uh, again, just types of patterns of evolution that you um, can see in the fossil record or see in things that are alive today. 
but the main ideas were convergent and divergent evolution and convergent, uh, not closely related, just um, have adapted for the same behavior, same, um, you know, structures, habitats, and um, divergent. This is where you have things maybe that don't look at all alike, but they came from a common ancestor and they have uh, homologous structures, you know, like, for example, us and a whale. Um, you know, we've diverged somewhere in the past, a common ancestor. Okay, I want to show you one more thing quickly. Again, that's this idea that um, just kind of again to wrap things up, what are, what are things that biologists look at for determining evolutionary relationships and the main ones are this uh, the fossil record which you guys have you know looked at and studied and did some you know simulations where you made the fossil tree uh, embryology development which I'll show you in a minute um, looking at biochemistry we have great tools today and technology that's around where we can compare DNA sequences compare amino acid sequences of proteins and see you know how closely related are we actually on a molecular level and see evolutionary relationships that way and then looking at um, anatomy just looking at homologous structures like we just talked about and or analogous structures to determine whether things are related or not closely related um, two I want to you know kind of focus on that we haven't really talked about much or embryology and biochemistry. So let's take a look at embryology. So this is embryology, the study of um, basically looking at how embryos develop from uh, the zygote stage on to, uh, you know, their fully formed body. And, um, you know, you just kind of see it's not a huge thing that's studied a lot, but it is something interesting to look at. So I'll kind of show you some, let you think a little bit. So these are uh, six different vertebrates. And I'll tell you there's a, um, there's two mammals there, and there's a fish, and there's a reptile, a bird, and an amphibian. So maybe you can make a guess at which one is, um, you know, which one is which. And I'll say one of these is a human. So you can maybe determine which one was little you. And maybe you knew or didn't know that you um, had a tail at one time and that tail kind of disappears as you develop as an embryo into your, um, you know, typical human form and structure. Uh, and then all vertebrates also have what's called pharyngeal gill slits, which are these little lines which can become a uh, become gills in some uh, vertebrates, but in other ones they become other parts of the respiratory or digestive system as the embryo develops. All right, here's about midway through embryological development for those six vertebrates. Maybe now you can start to get a better idea of what you think is, um, you know, a bird which one's a reptile, which one's an amphibian, which one's a fish, and again, the two mammals, and then one of them is a human. So, um, so lastly here, so at the last stages of development, you can see then which one was little you. It was the one on the right here. This one is uh, what you looked like at the very early stages of development. And then you had the rabbit there, um, the chicken, here's the bird, uh, the reptile, the amphibian, and the fish again we all like to so the point is here like again this just um supports the idea that that vertebrates are related um and there's a common ancestor to them but you, you can look at other groups of things in their embryological development too and uh this is just again looking at homologous structures versus and an, versus analogous structures which we had talked about before and that's the we looked at that too. So, um, so again, just the uh, the types of evidence that a biologist would look at: the fossil record, embryological development, homologous and analogous structures, and then comparing biochemistry, which is what the lab is, the activity that you're going to be doing. Um, which again is right back here, and number three, where you're going to look at some biochemical evidence of evolution. So. Um, just to let you know, if you're still watching this, um, 
for now, the different uh, conference times, which again, you have tomorrow, well, I guess today, when you're looking at this Wednesday from 12 o'clock to two o'clock, those are not mandatory at this point. If I ever um, want to do one, I'll let you know that you know, I need you to be there watching or whatever. But um, for now, I'm just planning on doing things like this and then you can ask questions during those conference times. So it's not mandatory. You can just hop on there if you have a question, excuse me, or you just want to say hello. Uh, it's kind of fun to talk and, you know, look at your dogs and other things that uh, happen during those conferences. But again, they're not mandatory. Um, and neither is the one that you know took place on Tuesday. At, uh, from nine to ten, but again, they're mainly for you if you have questions or uh, you want to talk about something. So, good luck with this stuff. Uh, again, it's all due Friday at eight o'clock. And again, if you have any questions, to um, Wednesday today, I guess is uh, from twelve to two, and uh, then I think Thursday nine to ten again. So, all right, take care.